All right, so for the last couple of weeks, we have been dealing with different subjects and different questions uh, uh, in this series called How To, and today we're going to do the same. Today we're going to be talking about guilt, all right? We're going to be talking about guilt. Over the last several weeks, we've dealt with depression, anxiety, and um, uh, what's the last thing that we dealt with? Uh, Anybody remember? Okay, we dealt with fear. That's good. So we dealt with depression, anxiety, and fear. And today we're going to be dealing with guilt. Everyone say guilt. All right. The, re- uh, the, the reality, once again, with guilt, guilt is actually something that every single person has experienced at some point in their life. There cannot be any person on this planet that says that I've never felt guilty in my life. Every single person has felt guilt at some point in their life. One of the things that we have to understand about guilt foundationally is, is two things. Guilt is objective in nature right? Guilt is objective in nature. But then there is also the subjective nature of guilt, objective and subjective, right? Objective and subjective. Now, what do I mean by that? Objective meaning that whether you feel it or not, for example, if you break the law, you are found guilty in the sight of the law. So you do something wrong, you violate a law of the land, uh, and, and, and you, you're in court, and even if you feel like you didn't do anything wrong, guess what? Objectively, you will be found guilty of breaking the law, right? That's objective guilt. Now, there is also subjective guilt, meaning this has to do with your feelings. Like, I feel guilty. I didn't break a law of the land. I didn't break a law in the relationship or something, Uh, but I feel like I did something wrong, and therefore I'm carrying a sense of guilt in my heart. I'm carrying, I have feelings of guilt. Now, that's subjective guilt. And so even as we talk about guilt today, I want to make sure that we understand both those things so that as it applies to your life, it might change a little bit, but you need to understand the guilt that you are feeling. Is it subjective or is it objective? And if you, but, but if you confuse those two things, then you'll misunderstand the, the rest of the message. So foundationally, I want you to know that there is such a thing as objective guilt that you will be found guilty in the sight of the law, in the sight of God, or in the sight of another individual when you break certain agreements, all right? But at the same time, there are situations where you will feel subjective guilt, and this has to do with your feelings, all right? And, And it has to do with your soul. That's why even when you go to the dictionary, this is what it said in the dictionary, guilt is a feeling, Right now, we understand that feelings have to do with our soul. It doesn't have to do with our spirit or with our body. It has to do with our soul. So it says, guilt is a. This is the uh, uh, dictionary definition. It says a feeling of worry or unhappiness that you have because you have done something wrong. Because you've done something wrong. I should not have done it. I've done it and I I cheated in that relationship. I cheated on that exam. I, I lied to that person. And even though you might not have been caught, you might not have, uh, uh, you know, the invigilator did not catch you, and and you uh, cheated successfully on the exam and all of these things, and yet you carry a sense of guilt. You you uh, uh, um, you know uh, uh, supplied the wrong uh, documents or falsified documents, and you got away with certain things, and yet there is a sense of guilt because of what you have done, right? And so that's what the dictionary is talking about as well. So there are times, but here's also an important thing. There are times when you might not feel guilty, but you are guilty, right? Now this is where the objective side comes up. You might not feel guilty, but you're actually guilty. But there are also times when you are not guilty and you feel guilty, right? There are times when you are not guilty and yet you feel guilty. And so a lot of times, spiritually speaking, this is where most people fall into the category of of, of living with guilt or living under the bondage of guilt, where the, where the reality is that they are not guilty. And yet, because of their soul, because they feel guilty, well, guess what happens? Once you feel guilty, once that is your, that, that's the way you feel about certain things, remember the, the eight uh, um, uh, uh, factors that affect our life, right? Once you feel a certain way, you will think a certain way. 
And all of the, the, the chain reaction follows through. Then your decisions, your actions, your habits, your character, and all of that will be shaped out of that feeling of guilt. So that's very important for us to understand. Now, the, we see these examples even in the Bible. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Go with me to Genesis chapter 42, please. Genesis 42 and verse 21 says this. It says, and this is talking about, uh, well, you'll get it. It says, and they said to one another, we are truly guilty about our brother. For we saw the distress and anguish in his soul when he begged to let him go. And we would not hear. So this distress and difficulty has come upon us. All right? Many of you know this is the story of Joseph and the brothers. And so... They started feeling guilty because of what they did. Again, remember, you feel guilty because of something wrong that you have done. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, um, in verse 5, it says, But David's conscience began to bother him because he had cut Saul's robe. Why? Because he started feeling guilty because of what he did. Again, he did something wrong, and therefore now the conscience bothers him. Now, therefore, he feels guilty. In the book of Ezra, chapter 9 and verse 6, it says, I prayed, O oh my God, I am utterly ashamed. I blush to lift up my face to you, for our sins are piled higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached to the heavens. Our sins are piled up, and therefore our guilt is reaching up. So the higher the sin goes, the higher the guilt goes. The higher the wrongdoings go, the higher the guilt goes in our life. And so these are just, again, there are literally hundreds of examples. You can just Google and say guilt verses, and it'll just give you verse after verse after verse about how people experienced guilt in the Bible and in the scripture. Now, here's one of the things that I want you to know. Guilt robs us from certain things right? And the most important thing that guilt robs us is this. Guilt robs us from peace with God and the peace of God, right? So if you're taking notes, write this down. Guilt will rob you from having peace with God and guilt will rob you of having peace of God. Remember, we don't, as Christians, we don't just have peace with God, we have the peace of God, because Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. So we have the peace of God in our lives as well. And guilt will rob us from that peace, because once you start having guilt and you start living out of guilt, you never feel like you're in a right relationship with the one that you're guilty of guilty with. And so you're never going to have peace with God. And if you never have peace with God, you'll always have a tough time receiving the things of God or, uh, or sustaining or living in the things that God has given to you. And if the peace that, 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 you don't, that, that you are supposed to have with God is not right, then the peace of God will also not be right in your life. All right? Now, a couple of reasons for guilt couple of reasons for guilt, all right? Number one, thinking that you have done something wrong or doing something wrong is the number one reason for feeling guilty, all right? Thinking or doing something wrong. Again, we, we just looked at uh, uh, the verses that we looked at, you know, Joseph and his brothers, uh, um, you know, Ezra talking about the guilt of their sin and, and David uh, doing something wrong, cutting off Saul's robe and feeling guilty. Number two, you feel guilty because of the right conscience, the right conscience. I'm going to show to you that not all guilt is bad. Not all guilt is bad, right? So number two, we, 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 uh, um, the, the second reason for guilt is having a right conscience. Go with me to John chapter 8 and verse 9. John chapter 8 and verse 9. And by the way, for those of you who are taking notes, uh, make sure you have a lot of ink uh, because I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures today, all right? John chapter 8 and verse 9. It says, then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. Now, many of you know that this is the story of the woman caught in adultery and she's brought in front of Jesus. Now, what happened here? They, they, these men, right, from young to old, they're, they're, they have stones in their hand ready to throw at this woman to kill her. And yet something happens. There is an issue with their conscience. Now what did they feel? They felt guilt. 
And because they felt guilt of themselves being sinners in the sight of God, what happened? One by one, the Bible says they left. So that's a good reason to have guilt, right? Because if you don't have that, you think that everything is right, even though it is not right between you and God. And so here, it is because of having the right conscience. Number three, so they experience the right kind of guilt. Number three is the wrong conscience. The wrong conscience. Uh, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. It says, what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. That dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. Now we see this kind of people all over the world. Sadly to say, we can even see these kinds of people even in the church. Why? How can you say that? Because if your mind is not constantly renewed by the word of God, guess what? Everything in the world will oppose the things of God. And so what the world will say is, uh, 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 what God says is dark, the, light, the, the, word will, the world will say it is light. What the word says is sweet, the world will say is bitter. Are you understanding that? And so it, your, your, your whole worldview and your conscience is completely changed. It is twisted. And therefore, what happens is you don't even realize when you're supposed to feel the guilt and you don't even realize when you are free from guilt, right? So number one, it is because you do or think that you are guilty, all right? That you start, uh, is one of the reasons for you feeling guilty, all right? Uh, sorry, it is um, because you do or think something wrong, right? That's, why you, uh, that's one of the reasons why you sense guilt. Number two is because of the right conscience, and because of, number three is because of the wrong conscience, all right? When, and, and by the way, when you start having guilt because of the wrong conscience, what happens is you start to overcompensate to make it right. You go in the opposite direction. You try to overdo things to make certain things right in your life. Now, what does the Bible have to say about conscience? Go with me to the book of Romans, please. Go with me to the book of Romans and chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. It says, obviously, the law applies to those who, to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. So how many people? Come on, how many people? Everybody. The entire world is guilty before God. Verse 23 in the same chapter says, for everyone has sinned and we have fallen short of God's glorious standard." So if you have sinned, that means you've do, done something wrong. And once you do something wrong, you are found guilty. And so subjectively, even if you don't feel guilty of breaking the law in the sight of God, guess what? Objectively, you are guilty. Right? Objectively, you are guilty. Because you can have an atheist saying, well, you know, there is no God. I didn't break any law. I, therefore, I'm not guilty. Well, you can be crying out. You can say that as loud as you want, my friend. But guess what? The reality is you are guilty. You are guilty. If, if there's a speed limit and, 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 and the policeman or the cop, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, checks and, and, that, and knows that you have crossed the speed limit, you can say, I don't feel like I crossed the speed limit. Guess what? It doesn't matter how you feel. Objectively, you're guilty of breaking the law because you went faster than what was told for you to go. Right? In the same way, it doesn't matter if you feel guilty or not. The objective reality is that you are found guilty in the sight of God. Now, so what happens when we, uh, um, uh, um, you know, when we know that we are guilty or when there is guilt in our lives and when it is not dealt with? Number one, self-condemnation. Self-condemnation. This is where you begin to say, you know, I'm getting what I deserve. I'm getting what I deserve. I did something wrong, and now I'm getting what I deserve. You, you, you get into a place of self-condemnation. Number two, you start blaming others. You either start condemning yourself, or you condemn others, and you blame others. This is what happened in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. Adam is found guilty, and what does he do? The first thing, the woman. 
He points the finger. He starts blaming, right? And we can see this even happening in our own lives, in our families, in our friendships and different things. Something goes wrong. And what do most people do immediately? Point the finger. Point the finger at someone else. And we start blaming. And, and, and when you get into that place, you actually end up getting to a place of self-righteousness. You become self-righteous. No, it wasn't me. It was you. It was you. It was you. And you start pointing the fingers at other people in your life. Now, here are some positive aspects of guilt. Positive aspects of guilt. And then for the rest of the time, I'm going to go into how we can overcome this guilt. All right? Some positive aspects of guilt are these. Number one, you can have positive change out of it. When a person feels guilty and realizes that they're guilty, they can actually make a decision to say, okay, I am going to change for the better. I'm going to start making godly decisions. I'm going to start having godly friendships. I'm going to start making godly decisions in my life. And there can be positive change out of feeling guilty. Number two, repentance. Repentance. See, every one of us repented in our lives only when we found out that we were guilty. If you never found out you're guilty, what are you repenting for? There's nothing to repent for. So there is the, the, the positive aspect of guilt is that you will repent or you have the opportunity to repent and ask for forgiveness. Number three, you have the opportunity to receive and give forgiveness. Receive and give forgiveness. That's the positive aspect of guilt. Receive and give forgiveness. All right? Now, let's get into the aspect of when somebody... Again, the, the whole question for today was how do we overcome guilt? Because, again, even though there are certain positive aspects of it, uh, most people suffer from the negative aspects of guilt, of the shame and it becomes a weight in their life, and perpetually they only live from the foundation of a guilty person, a guilty conscience. They carry and have a guilty conscience, and everything that they do, they do it out of a guilty conscience. So, number one, how do you overcome guilt? Number one, repent. Repent. Psalm 32 verse 5 says this, Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. And this is what most of us do. We try to hide. We don't, instead of confessing, instead of coming face to face with reality, we try to hide it. And guess what? The longer you hide it, the heavier it begins to become in your life. And the heavier it gets, the more difficult it becomes to live the kind of life that God has called us to live. And so the psalmist here says, Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me, and all my guilt is gone. Hallelujah. All my guilt is gone. How did the guilt go? By him repenting before God. So the first and foremost thing that everyone should be thinking about, if you are carrying guilt, have you asked God, have you come face to face with God and said, God, I know I'm feeling guilty and I feel guilty because of, because of, I've, I've wronged that person. God, I have wronged you. God, I have robbed from you. God, I have not given you first priority in my life. God, I, 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 I you know, put you on the back burner. I forgot about you, whatever it is. That reason, you've got to come face to face with God and say, God, I repent of that. And when you do, there's forgiveness that can be received. All right. Number two, leave the past behind. Leave the past behind. Too many people live their life in the past. Thinking about the past, meditating upon the past, wondering what things they could change in the past, right? Thinking about how their, their decisions could have been different. Guess what? You can't do anything about it. The reality is now you've got the present. There's no uh, uh, point, there's no benefit about thinking and dwelling on the past. If there's any reason to think about the past or look back, it's just to look at how things can be made better and then start making those changes. There's no point in looking back and dwelling in that place. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, 
Verse 13, he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press on toward the goal of, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Remember, you can't change the past. I can't change the past. You know who can? God can redeem the past. You can change the past, but it can be redeemed. But it will not be redeemed by you dwelling on it. It's going to be redeemed by coming to God and saying, God, I repent and here's my life and here's my, uh, my, my foolish decisions and everything that happened in my life. And guess what? God will supernaturally redeem all of that. And you will be able to live the life that he has called you to live. So number one, repent. Number two, leave the past behind. Number three, believe in the power of the blood. More specifically, believe in the power of the blood of Jesus. Believe in the power of the blood of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 says this. Just think how much more. Everyone say more. more. How much more? How much? He's comparing something. He's comparing the blood of animals and now in this verse, he says, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. That first part of that verse, one more time. How much more will the blood of Christ will purify our conscience for, from sinful deeds? See, he's purifying not just the deeds, but our conscience is being purified. Our conscience is being purified. So you've got to have faith and belief in the power of the blood of Jesus. If your conscience is not worked on, if your conscience, if you don't realize that your conscience has been purified by the blood of Jesus, the guilt will remain. You've got to believe that, the, that, that Jesus' blood took care of that guilty conscience. Again, I want you to know that in spite of everything that you've done, in spite of all the things that went wrong in your life, this is what Jesus says about you. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. Matthew 26 and 28. It says, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. See, that blood, see, again, why do you feel guilty? Because of doing something wrong. In other words, you feel guilty because of sin. And here the Bible is saying that the blood is what forgives, which means once the blood was poured out for you, it already was, was, was sent by God to take care of your guilty conscience. You've got to believe that the blood was able to do the work that was needed to be done. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it says, um, so guard yourselves and God's people, feed and shepherd God's people, his church, look at this, purchased with his own blood. Purchased with his own blood. But, which means, in spite of everything that was done in the past, you were purchased by God with his precious blood. So don't ever let the guilt of some past actions carry you or affect your life in the present. You have been forgiven. Let's go on to uh, the fourth way. The fourth way. Remember. How do you get over guilt? Remember that God doesn't remember your sins. Remember that God doesn't remember your sins. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. Hebrews 8 and verse 12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. See, my friend, please get this. Without sin and without lawless deeds, there is no guilt. If there is guilt, that means at some point there was sin and there was a lawless deed. But then, what God says is, in the new covenant, he says, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. 
See, guilt can only survive in a person's life when you are constantly remembering those things. And here's my point. If God decided to forget your sins and your lawless deeds, what business do you and I have remembering those same sins? We don't have any business with them. It's time to get, it's time to get rid of them. It's time to forget them. Amen? In, in Psalm 103 and verse 12, it says, He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Now, how far is the east from the west? Exactly. That's how far it is. Right? That's how far it is. And that's how far your sins have been removed from you. See, remember I said in the very beginning, there are times when a person is actually guilty and they feel like they're not guilty, right? For, for example, that's, uh, uh, you know, again, in the case of an atheist, for example, they might say, I'm not guilty before God, and yet the reality is that they are. Uh, you might speak, go over the speeding limit and you might not feel like you're guilty, but the law will definitely say that you are guilty of breaking the law, right? But then there are those people, you are not guilty and yet you carry the sense of guilt, right? You carry the sense of guilt. Like, for example, with, with my daughters, uh, uh, now Christina is, is growing up, and now she, she takes care of her uh, uh, sister Ivanka, and they, they, they do a lot of stuff together, and every once in a while, uh, um, you, know, uh, you know, either Arpita or I will say, hey, take care of uh, uh, Cutie, and you know, uh, just go into your rooms and play for some time. And every once in a while, uh, and, and Christina does a great job with it, you know, she really loves her sister, takes care of her sister, does a great, great job. But every once in a while, somebody, uh, 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 Cutie will come running out of that room crying right? Or something goes wrong or something is spilled. And, and all of a sudden, we go into the room, you know, the water is spilled or they're coloring, uh, uh, you know, crayons or paints or something is spilled. And we go in and say, oh, it's okay, it's okay, we'll, we'll clean it up. And all of a sudden, even though my daughter Christina is not guilty of breaking any law, all of a sudden she feels like she's disappointed the father and mother. She feels like I let them down. And, and like you, I can see it in her face. I can see it in her countenance. All of a sudden, she feels like mom and dad gave me the responsibility of taking care of my sister, and I was not able to do a good job at it. And all of a sudden, sometimes she'll go into a corner. Sometimes she'll become sad, and, and, and I'll have to tell, no, 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 you didn't do anything wrong. You're fine. You did a good job. It's okay. There's nothing wrong by coloring uh, uh, the paints or something getting spilled. We can clean it up, and yet... Sometimes, like, it takes time for her. She feels like she let someone down. She feels like she let someone down. And the reality is, she did not let me down. I was not disappointed as the father for not a split second. Not a split second was I disappointed with my daughter. And yet, somehow, some way, she carries that guilt. It'll take her a while to get over that guilt. And do you know there's so many Christians that live like that? In spite of what the Bible says, in spite of what the Father says, the Father looks at you and says, in Christ, I love you. I am so pleased with you. I know you're my righteousness. I know you are holy. I know you are good. And yet we live with the sense of guilt because we have a wrong understanding of how the Father views us. I hope you understand what I'm saying. And that can rob us. So what happens when my daughter feels guilty? She'll go away into the corner. She'll go away into the room. And she won't come into my lap. She won't let me hug her. Guess what's happening? The peace she has with me is robbed. The peace she has with me is robbed. And that's what I said in the very beginning. Guilt robs us of the peace with God and the peace of God. And so, again, if you're not careful, this can happen in our lives as well. Not remembering that God has forgotten about our sins, willfully forgotten about our sins. Amen? All right, let's quickly move on. Number five, remember that you are free. Remember that you are free. 
Again, I'm talking to Christians right now. And if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, just keep listening because I have some great news for you. All right? Remember that you are free. John chapter 8 and verse 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. Everyone say truly free. Come on, truly free. Not just in your imagination. You are actually truly free. Why? Not because you did something right. Not because you decided to be free. Because the Son set you free. The only people who are truly free are the people who are set free by the Son. By Jesus Christ. So this is not about you one day deciding, I'm not guilty. No, that's not how it works. The Son has to set you free. And only when He sets you free, you are truly free indeed. So if you are a person that places your faith in Christ, guess what? You are free. You are free. Free from all the bad mistakes. Free from all those wrong decisions. Again, sometimes, again, even as parents... See, now, now that I'm a parent and, 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 uh, and I think about my parents and how they raised me and all of these things, and as parents, we make decisions for our children and we make decisions, you know, for, in regards to their education, to, towards their well-being, towards their spiritual life and towards uh, their financial life and all of these things. And sometimes you can quickly compare yourself to someone else. And you, you can quickly say, you know, I should have done this, I should have done that. And the guilt of you making some wrong decisions as a parent will eat you up. The guilt of you making some wrong decisions, in, you know, uh, relationally speaking, the guilt and the, the, the shame of you making some wrong decisions before you got married can eat you up and eat your marriage alive. But you've got to understand, in Christ, you are free from that. You're free from that, my friend. Don't carry that guilt any longer. Don't carry that guilt. Number six. Number six, you get over guilt, you overcome guilt, number six, by receiving the love of God. By receiving the love of God. Again, when, when people live in guilt, man, they, it, it completely uh, warps their understanding of God. It warps their understanding of, about the love of God. It warps their understanding about the nature and character of God. Again, just for time, uh, uh, go to John chapter 3, please. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. My friend, I know you might feel guilty. Again, I said, if you have not placed your faith in Christ, just keep listening to me. And that's because I wanted to get to this point. If you feel guilty because of what you've done, you might feel like I ran away from God. I hated God. I did not want to have anything to do with God. I want you to know God sent Jesus just for you. God sent Jesus just for you. That's why it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When he says the world, he's not talking about the people who attend church, read their Bibles, tithe every week, and, and, and do all of these uh, 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 you know, godly things and have a godly behavior 24-7, 365. No, he's talking about the people who are living far away from God, people who are in depression, people who are in guilt and anxiety, fear and sin and torment and bondage and addiction. Wrapped up in evil. That's who he came for. And then verse 17 says, God sent his son into this world so that the world through him might be saved. Not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why Jesus came. So receive his love. Receive his love. Hallelujah. And then finally, you overcome guilt by knowing who you are in Christ. By knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. Very quickly, I just want to give a quick recap. Again, how do we overcome guilt? I, give you, I gave you seven different ways. Number one, repent. It starts with repentance. Repenting of, of all the wrongs. Repenting of, of the guilt that you are carrying and going before God so that all your guilt can be removed. Number two, by leaving the past behind. Leaving the past behind. But uh, remember that nothing can be changed by leaving the past behind. Number three, 
believing in the power of the blood of Jesus. Believing in the power of the blood of Jesus. Why? Because it is what purifies not just your deeds, but your conscience. But your conscience as well. Number four, we talked about uh, remember the fact that God doesn't remember your sins. Remember, because again, we carry this guilt because I wonder if God is thinking about that wrongdoing. I wonder if God is thinking about that sin. I wonder if God is thinking about what I did last week. I wonder if God is thinking about what I did five years ago to that person, six years ago to that family. All of these things, and that guilt robs us from the life that God has for us. Number five, remember that you are free in the sight of God. Why? Because whom the Son has set us free is truly free is truly free. So in sp- even if you feel guilty, please understand you're not. Please understand you're not. Number six, receive the love of God. Receive the love of God. So you can only get to a place where you can say that you're truly free only when you receive the love. So receive the love. And number seven, know who you are in Christ. Know who you are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, it says, for if anyone... But you might think, but pastor, you know, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the lifestyle I've lived. You don't know the friends I had. You don't know the decisions I made. My friend, the reality is even if I don't, God does. And he decided to put these words and he said, if anyone, that includes you. He says, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. You are not the old person. You're not the old person. Verse 21 says, For he who he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So who are you in Christ? You're the righteousness of God. You're the righteousness of God. In spite of everything that might have happened or did not happen in the past, today, in Christ, you are the righteousness of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, uh, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Not even a little bit. It's all gone. In Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. I'll read that one more time. He is so rich in kindness. Who? God. The God of the universe. The God, the creator of heaven and earth. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom. You are free. You don't have to live in the bondage of guilt. He purchased your freedom and my freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins forgave our sins. And finally, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. I mean, how good is this? God says, come, let's settle, let's sit down, and let's settle this. See, again, you are guilty before God. And God says something. He says, all right, this whole guilt business, let's sit down. Let's settle this issue. It's like two friends. You have an issue. Something goes wrong. There are two. It's maybe a husband and wife. Maybe two people in in the family. And then they say, all right, let's sit down and let's talk. Let's settle this issue. Let's settle the matter. And God says, let's settle this. Though your sins are like scarlet. So he's not saying that our sins are not there or that our sins are not like scarlet. He says, though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. He says, I will make them. You don't make them, my friends. He does. I will make them as white as snow, though they are red like crimson. What? Your sins and my sins. I will make them as white as snow. 
as wool. I will make them as white as wool. This is the God you serve. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the reason why you don't have to live in guilt. And this is how you overcome guilt in your life. I pray that this message brings hope. I pray that this message brings faith. I pray that this message brings freedom to every single person that is watching. For some of you, you're dealing with stuff from a long time. And I'm asking that you think over this. Listen to this message a couple of times. <laughs> Meditate on the word so that you no longer have to live in guilt, but in the freedom that comes from God Almighty. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercies, your love. We thank you that you are so rich in kindness, so rich in love, so rich in mercy, so rich in grace. So rich in goodness. We thank you that your goodness is running after us. You're not standing somewhere with goodness, Lord. You are chasing us. You're running after us. You're not demanding, you're not standing somewhere high and demanding that we come to you. But you are actually actively chasing us. And I thank you for chasing us down today. I thank, you, I thank you, Lord, that there are several people right now that are experiencing your goodness like never before. I thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is doing a work deep down on the inside of them. I thank you, Lord, that there is a surgery that is taking place in the hearts of people. That that guilt is being removed forever. I thank you for it. Lord, I thank you that as a result of the guilt being gone, that people will experience healing in their life. Healing in their physical bodies. Healing in their relationships. Healing in their emotions. We receive that. And I declare that. And I decree that. Just receive it by faith right now in the name of Jesus. We glorify you. Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, we worship you. It is by your blood that we are forever free. And we declare whom the Son has set free is truly free indeed. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and everyone said, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah.